Welcome to Montgomery Heart and Wellness, and we have a special show tonight. We're going to be talking about diabetes, and notice that I'm talk, I'm using the word we. I use the word we a lot, but uh, the we really means something because I have the honor and pleasure to invite an esteemed colleague of mine uh, whom I had the opportunity to meet, I think it may have been a month ago now, uh, at another conference we were both speaking and uh, she gave perhaps one of the most dynamic talks on diabetes that I've ever heard. And so as a result of that, uh, I decided to do a talk on diabetes. Now, the topic is diabetes. And the question is, um, can diabetes be reversed? Now, notice I didn't distinguish type 1 from type 2. And we're going to break that down for you because... I think it's important for us to talk about this whole concept of diabetes. As a cardiologist, I see a lot of uh, patients with diabetes. And uh, <clears throat> and so it's an issue that we have to deal with because diabetes predisposes to heart disease. And lots of patients with heart and renal disease have diabetes. So it's an important topic. So I'm going to uh, share the bio of Dr. Helen Powell started. Dr. Helen Powell started is a duly trained board certified physician in both internal medicine and physical medicine rehab. Uh, she is one of only two doctors who were accepted in the prestigious Johns Hopkins Sinai Hospital program uh, the year she trained. So she also has a fellowship trained in sports medicine and non surgical orthopedics. Uh, at the beginning of her third year of medical school, she unfortunately lost her mother to that exacerbated illness of type 2 diabetes. Uh, and subsequently, her dad had this metastatic cancer exacerbation by diabetes. So both her parents died in diseases related to diabetes. These losses were the impetus for her to embark upon a deep study into how nutrition impacts the inner workings of the human body. With the memory of her parents, close to her heart, she began incorporating lifestyle changes into her patient protocols. These protocols resulted in positive outcomes on decreased pain and subsequent decreased need for interventional procedures, guiding her to shift her practice's focus toward reversing type 2 diabetes using lifestyle changes. Dr. Helen's focus is reversing type 2 diabetes. She has authored books, Reverse It, and the Reverse It Success Journal, uh, the pair serve as the foundation for an intensive program for reversing the potentially deadly disease. She was host of the show Creative Cooking, where she creates and shares recipes to reverse type 2 diabetes. Dr. Helen demonstrates her passion for reversing type 2 diabetes in her 100% virtual practice, where she provides tools to not only reverse disease, but also the foundation to never see it again. Dr. Helen is married to, Dr. Don, uh, the, to John Stoddard, a recording artist and composer. Together, they have two beautiful daughters, with one following her father's footsteps and the other one following her mother's. Her favorite pastime is spending time with their family, with her family, which includes her Harry Chow Chow son, Kado. So without further ado, uh, I want to welcome Dr. Helen Powell Stoddard. Welcome to the show. Hi, how are you? How are you doing this evening? Thank you so much. This is really an incredible opportunity to be able to speak with your audience. So I'm so grateful that you gave me the opportunity and allowed me to come in and just spend a little time in here. You know, thank you for joining us. And, and as I said in, in my initial commentary, you know, during your presentation, I recall listening to it and lots of thoughts are going through my head and, and the whole issue of reversibility of diabetes. Uh, and, and we're going to get into that in our discussion, but just sort of lay the foundation. What I'd like to do is share with the audience um, a, a general discussion about diabetes in general. You know, what's diabetes? You know, the different types of diabetes. I think most people uh, have a general sense of what diabetes is. or know about type 1, type 2. People talk about type 3. What, what's your general... Um, take on diabetes, what would you say the uh, diabetes is in general and in some of the breakdown of different types? 
Sure, absolutely. Well, as you know, type 2 diabetes or diabetes as a whole is really just a problem with metabolizing blood sugars. And so people tend to have problems with, with controlling their blood glucose levels. There are several different types of the most commonly known types or the ones that are known most commonly are type 1 and type 2. And in type two, type one diabetes, we're really talking about diabetes that that where the cells of the pancreas are damaged and they're no longer functioning, so that people are not able to actually secrete insulin. And insulin is what is necessary to bring the glucose. It's like an escort that brings the glucose inside of the cells for it to be used for energy. And the glucose is really your major source of energy. That's the one that your body likes. And so to bring it in, it needs insulin to be ushered inside of the cells. And so that is a problem with type 1 diabetics because they, they are not able to make it. The second type, which is most commonly, which is probably 90%, at least 90%, is secondary to a damage to the pancreatic cells where they're not able to, they're actually making insulin, but the, but the cells don't recognize the insulin. And so because they don't recognize the insulin, you run into this phenomenon called insulin resistance. Yeah, and that's, you know, and that's really the common, the, the two working diagnoses we work with. And people talk about other components, a mixture, a combination. But essentially, I think, you know, for this discussion, type 1 and type 2, are the critical ones uh, that we deal with. And, and certainly in, in my population, uh, we see uh, a lot of patients with type 2 diabetes. Uh, so focusing on type 2 diabetes and the whole issue of reversibility, uh, because you know we, we practice in the same lane, we have a similar mindset. Yes. But for the sake of the audience, do you think type 2 diabetes is reversible? I want to take that one first. Well, type 2 diabetes is absolutely reversible. Um, there's, there's probably a, a more than enough people who've actually proven that, that type 2 diabetes is reversible. Now, does that mean that it can never come back? It, it, it does not, because if you continue to do the things that caused it, then the disease will absolutely come back. And I think about Hippocrates, he said, in, in order to help somebody overcome something, and I'm paraphrasing, you must first find out if they're willing to stop doing the thing that caused the disease in the first place. <laughs> and so yeah. when we talk about that, uh, that if you, if you change some things in your lifestyle, then absolutely type two diabetes is reversible. Well, I, I am very careful to call it a diet exacerbated illness. It's a mm. diet exacerbated illness. So it is really coming from the things that we consume, the foods that we eat, those things that we that are difficult to tear ourselves away from, those things. Yes. You know, that, that yeah, I like that point you make. And certainly the, the whole issue in terms of the behavior. You know, I, I talk to my patients often and I'll tell them, you know, you're 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 your illness isn't diabetes. Your illness isn't high blood pressure. Your illness isn't heart failure. Your illness is the desire for that fat lifestyle that brings on the manifestation of these diseases. Absolutely. And so it's your desire for the bad food in this case, or maybe the in, in many other cases, other poor lifestyle, desire for the sedentary behavior, et cetera. And so it's really the lifestyle. And so, and I want to emphasize that many people have different think, thoughts on it. Uh, I still have lots of patients who come in and tell me that the doctor said with type 2 diabetes is not reversible. You, you have to be on insulin for life. You have to be on medications for life. And I just want to you know, emphasize that, especially with type 2 diabetes. And I found it in my practice to be the most responsive. Uh, it's one of the ills that's most responsive to. to I lost you. Are you still there? Oh, 
Okay. You can you hear me now? Yeah, I can hear you now. Okay. We went out a little blank there. I've been having a little bit of internet problems, so I apologize to the audience. But as I was saying, uh, I have lots of patients who still come and they say that their doctor will tell them that, you know, diabetes can't be reversed and on the medication for life. And so this is clearly something that I want to emphasize that this is not the case. And so uh, there is hope if you have type 2 diabetes. Are there any other misconceptions that you come across from patients or some of your colleagues regarding diabetes, type 2 or otherwise? You know, there are. It's, it's interesting. There are a lot of myths about type 2 diabetes. We just discussed one, one being that it is a is a progressive and chronic disease that you cannot get rid of, that your body just has to live with and that it has to learn to tolerate. That is certainly one of the misconceptions that I tend to have to fight on a regular basis so that people really understand that this is really not, it does not have to be chronic and it does not have to be progressive. Another thing that um, that we talk about is really what the causes are of type 2 diabetes. And most people think that it's, it's all about the sugar that we're consuming, but there's so many other factors that, are, that, that we concern ourselves with. One being lipotoxicity, meaning too much fat mm -hmm. in the diet. That's mm. that's one of the issues. And another one that is not not talked about very much is this idea of 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 this gluten damaging the cells that produce the insulin. You know, you know that this is fascinating because um, in your presentation, you had well several slides that I like, of course, there was one slide that had a list of things that contributed to diabetes or insulin resistance. And lipotoxicity, the reactive oxygen species, and you know other types of things. So these are, in fact, the list consists of a lot of biochemical uh, toxins. And, and I'm glad you mentioned the fat because fat is a part of that, but it's really the unhealthy fats uh, and the toxic fats along with other substances that are toxic. And Indeed. so these are things that contribute to fat buildup in cells, et cetera. So it's really the toxin that contributes to the fat. It's not only the fat you eat, but the toxic fat and the other toxic substances that you bring into the system. Then the body reacts by creating fat cells to store these toxins. And so this is clearly something that we see. And the other thing you, know, you mentioned is gluten. Now we, certainly in the plant-based community, talk a lot about dairy. Mm -hmm. uh, and, there's, and, and I talked a lot about dairy in terms of um, the autoimmune reaction to casein protein. There's been some data showing in, in young kids uh, uh, antibodies to casein protein cross react to beta cells. And so clearly that's been a message that's discussed. But when you talked about gluten and your breakdown of gluten, I thought it was pretty impressive. And can you, first and foremost, share this whole issue of gluten and how it's toxic uh, from the standpoint of diabetes, and and you got into some uh, uh, details about gluten that I had never heard before. Oh, absolutely! I can certainly share with that. I was I was looking to see if I can actually pull up a um, some of the something so that your audience can have a better look at it. Uh, mm -hmm. And while it's trying to trying to do what it's doing, gluten is really a very interesting thing. Uh, so as you know, or may not know, gluten is, or your audience, that gluten is something that's found in wheat. It's found in barley and rye. And it is actually the part of the, it's a, a protein in those, in those grains that actually give it, it its ability to, to give it some elasticity. And it also gives it the stability. And so you'll see that there's gluten in a lot of different things. So, because it's it structurally, it has such a, a structural integrity that it is used to kind of thicken things or is used to flavor things. And so you'll see that in a lot. If you watch somebody make a pizza dough and you see that they're able to just roll it around on their hands, then you'll see that they have it. So it has two proteins. Yes, I see that. It's two proteins that has the gluten and has the gliadin. 
and and those two parts the 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 gliadin portion is the part that is really the antigenic part that's the part where people tend to have problems with it particularly celiacs that's the part that is antigenic meaning that it can cause mouth and immune response the other part is the part that gives it it's the elasticity that's the glutenin and so those two components of that gives it this structural integrity that allows people to use it in all these different up complex and these different applications in cooking and i absolutely love to cook so I, I tend to know how people are using these things. And there were lots of changes that I had to make when I discovered all of these different things about the gluten. But what's really interesting about this, this gluten is that this is a new, this is a new gluten that our bodies are really just not accustomed to. This gluten has actually been hybridized and it's been hybridized and hybridization actually means putting two seeds in one soil and that's actually something that was done because because there was this this need for society to be able to provide more food to people, to nations that are hungering. And so they came up with the idea to make some changes to it. There were problems with the gluten before where it's it's difficult to grow it because, you know, the pesticides, there are all these kinds of diseases that they have to worry with. And, and maybe they were trying to to give enough of the gluten they weren't able to because they lost it. Maybe it was blight or maybe it was it was something else. So they tried to like, how can we make this, this grain resistant so that it doesn't, it, it's not, we don't lose it because of diseases and how do we do that? So they started doing some things with it, tampering with it, kind of making some, 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 some switches and some changes to it. So they started, using these two forms of different forms of of different wheat and what you know today is is what is called uh the seminal or durham wheat you know the durham wheat that's the one that we are accustomed to eating but the original wheat the one that you grew up with and the one that i grew up with is actually called einkorn wheat and that is the original molecule that has never been tampered with and we can call it for lack of a better word, an heirloom wheat. And so what's very interesting about that is that the wheat that that we grew up on, on didn't have as much elasticity. It took some time for it to grow to give it that elasticity. So you'd have to let your bread rise a lot longer or you know different things like that so that the gluten had an opportunity to be absorbed. Well that that's not the way it is now. It the, the, the glutinous part of it makes that elasticity pretty quickly now. But that came at a an unfortunate uh, it, it, it's unfortunate that it came with a cost for us because what that what that tend to have done what that has done now is that the portion the antigenic portion of the gluten is so much higher than the than the one that makes the elasticity and because of that you see how tall the wheat used to be before it was hybridized and mm -hmm. if you look at the next slide you can see that that with that hybridization, it actually it shortened the 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 gluten, and so the the gluten is not as tall as it used to. You can no longer look at it almost eye to eye. You kind of look down on it now because it where it used to be six feet, it's now about two feet. And what mm. that means is that it's now more concentrated. There's more concentrated gluten inside each one of those seeds. And that is actually the antigenic portion of it. And that's the part that that our bodies are not able to tolerate so well. So so there's something to be said about looking down on this wheat because it is it, it doesn't it's not as healthy for us as the original wheat that God made. So this picture has the original wheat and it's, it's much taller. It's up to her yes. chest. Yes. And this is what we have today. And this is what we have today. Wow. You know, again, that's very impressive and, and largely, um, again, I've, I've not heard many, I've not heard anyone pointed out to this level of detail that you have. Uh, I mean, and I, I go to a fair number of uh, talks and um, and I'm, I'm and, and I'll have to say I've, I've always speculated that the uh, and I'm going through the different slides. I always speculated 
that the wheat of, say, hundreds or thousands years ago was different than what we have now. Uh, and of course, you're much more generous. <laughs> you said, well, you know, they made these changes because they wanted to feed more poor people. I think they made the change and wanted to make more money. But again, I don't know. <laughs> Uh, uh, it, it's, it could, could be either way, but, but clearly, um, uh, here's a slide again. Uh, I guess it's showing some molecular difference here. Yes. Yeah, so when, when insulin is made, it, it actually comes as like one single chain and as it matures, mm -hmm. it's, it goes into like six different chains. That's what the normal one will look like. But mm -hmm. with this hybridization, and there hasn't been research. This is just my gestalt. I, this is what this is the way I can see, you know, in the process of making things, you can see how things can happen, how it can be damaged in such in, in, in different ways. And so when you look at the molecular structure of it and you see that that you know, we, we've talked a lot about a lot about in the past, we've talked about the that there was something wrong with the insulin receptor where insulin attaches to the cell. Yes. Um, but, but we never really talked about the problem with insulin, the molecule of insulin itself. Ah. And so- well, You think it's a dual problem. You think that, is it the receptor and the molecule are both affected? Exactly, exactly. Mm. So that it doesn't come out. So that insulin is supposed to just be like a key to open the cell so all of that glucose can go inside of it. But, you know, we do know that with lipotoxicity, for instance, it's the lock itself, that receptor itself is gummed up. You can't get, get it in there. And this one that we're showing now is really something wrong with the insulin itself. The key. So that the insulin, the, the key, the, there's a problem with the key itself and not just the lock. That's impressive. That's impressive. You know, and I think it's important to understand that. And, um, you know, understanding uh, the, the traditional wheat and the new wheat, because everyone says, OK, wheat is bad. And lots of people have a problem with wheat, but we just simply don't know why. Um, what's been your experience with your patients when you have them go on the traditional wheat? Because it is available. I mean, it's available in stores. And there, there are two kind ones, what, einkorn and the other Einkorn. Ones, okay. Einkorn and durum wheat. Okay. So the einkorn is the more preferable one. The durum wheat is, what, the third generation hybridized? Yes, it's like the fourth generation hybrid. Fourth so, oh my goodness. Okay. Yeah, so it's 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 interesting because you know the second generation is Emmer, and there weren't many problems with Emmer wheat. That seemed mm. to be tolerated quite well. Then mm. the third generation is getting into like spelt, and spelt seems to be tolerated pretty well. But it's it's like the the once we got to the the hybridization of not it's it's like uh, spelt with with uh, with another one, then it, it's like it's not tolerant. It's like a hybrid and a hybrid together. The, it, it, the body just really can't tolerate it very well. So this is a, and here's a slide that shows the ancient wheat and as a side-by-side -side picture um, of the ancient wheat and what it looks like and the, the uh, new stuff. And, you know, these, what do you call them kernels or whatever, are much larger. Yes. Much um, larger, yes. Yeah, and so that's quite interesting, and and the breakdown of the the um, uh, glutenin versus the gliatin, mm -hmm. and the 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 the, the new wheat has a greater component of the gliatin. Is that correct? Yes. And so that's why there's a greater antigenic. And so you have a list here with the breakdown of einkorn, karasin versus emmer. And this is the, the drum weeds, the fourth generation. So mm -hmm. these first three are, are reasonably well tolerated. Uh, of course, yes. it's probably best to go here at the yes. top. Yes, at the top. Uh, and I, and I <laughs> believe it or not, I went out and bought uh, some einkorn uh, flowers. So we're going to have our, our chefs make uh, our bread using the einkorn 
uh, yes. uh, uh, flowers. So I'll, I'll keep you posted on our project. Yes, please keep me posted. I've made, I've been, I made some pancakes the other morning and I've made biscuits and I've made. Oh my goodness. Yeah. <laughs> and you finished some recipes. Yeah, absolutely. Ah, ah, absolutely. Ah, ah. Yes, so, it's, it's, it's very good. Very good. Oh, oh, I yeah, wish I had a. Oh, let me see if I can even uh, show you a picture of my pancakes that I made the other day. No, that's um, fine. That's fine. Now, right here, you have this uh, breakdown here: protein versus gluten in the different species. Um, what is our what is our take on this? So that's that's really kind of showing that there's a that that the einkorn wheat is really high in protein. It, it's it's very high in protein. So you are not, you know, people that eat whole food, you know, people who question people who eat whole food plant based are always concerned about where you're going to get your protein from. And so that really is not an issue with with where the protein is coming from. And so you look at that versus durum wheat, it actually has more protein in it than durum wheat. Mm -hmm. But the yeah. gluten is really that gluten you see, is if you look at that, that gluten is, and it, this, this, this table is a little difficult. If you go to the next one, it kind of shows you more of like the ratios. And so mm. when you see like the ratio, you can see the durum wheat is like a one to two ratio of the gliadin to the glutenin. Mm. Where the emmer, the einkorn wheat is like a one to three ratio. Ah, uh, yes. Yeah. yeah. And so because it's close, there's, there's it, the, that, that concentration, that that whole idea of the wheat being taller and now being shorter really means that that the that the gluten is actually I, I think of it as more concentrated mm. inside of each one of those wheat germ, wheat, wheat kernels. And so because it's more concentrated, you get this more you get more of the elasticity, but you also get more of the intolerance. You get more of that gliadin. And one of the interesting things is that. You know, when we're in Europe, I don't get bloating from eating mm -hmm. wheat. But when I'm in the States, I get bloating. And that was really interesting. As, as a matter of fact, the company that I started investigating first, the reason that 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 this has actually come into into more of a commonality. And I think we're going to see more and more of it coming on it, it, coming on the shelves is that the family, this is the company is owned by a family. And what happened was the daughter actually had asthma mm. and it, she couldn't tolerate every time she would eat something with gluten in it, she would, would develop these asthmatic attacks. But the family is actually from Italy. The, her dad and mom, I believe, are both from Italy or one is from Italy. And they noticed that when they were in Italy, that didn't happen. Mm. And so they found out and started investigating and saw that they were actually using a whole different wheat than what we were using. And that when they used that, they were able to tolerate it. So now they have they have farms in Europe that are actually farming this, this wheat to try to get it back. Because really, you know, this whole hybridization actually started like in the 1960s and, and more and more of it was happening. So by the 1980s, you really couldn't find any wheat that hadn't been hybridized. Wow. Wow. And that that really is. And if you look at celiac disease, you can see that celiac disease just kept, kept, kept creeping up and creeping up and creeping up. More and more people are, in, are not able to tolerate it. More and more people, not, not only celiac disease, obviously, that's an extreme portion. That's an extreme reaction, an extreme re immune reaction. But there's so many people who get gas and bloating from it or there are people who just can't tolerate it. They get stomach pain and you know different yes. things of that nature and with the and with the einkorn pancakes and biscuits you don't have that at all yeah no i don't have it don't all. have it at all yeah and uh you know and i'm glad you mentioned celiac disease because we talk about celiac disease and we think of that that's the only disorder that is uh a group of people that are sensitive to to to, to gluten or, or wheat or gluten but yes. as you also pointed out, other people who don't have celiac disease have other symptoms like bloating and the like. And then the individuals who don't have bloating. So we have uh, lots of our patients we measure inflammatory markers and uh, their you know, cholesterol and blood sugar, all these other 
chronic inflammatory manifestation of disease, yes. uh, we find to be made worse when they're on gluten. And so, uh, so it's not just celiac disease, which is sort of a tip of the iceberg and a special kind of outward manifestation to gluten intolerance, but the other not so obvious adverse manifestation which is underscored by inflammation, mm -hmm. uh, which is what you're dealing with. And so um, it's very interesting you, you point that out uh, with celiac disease. Um, and here, of course, you show the breakdown of the endosperm, the bran, and the, the germ. And of course, uh, when we refine it, we take the, 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 the core off and the germ, and we're sort of left with the starchy um, component and that's your processed white breads mm -hmm. and so on so i'm waiting to see those pictures of your uh, pancakes, pancakes. So, I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm trying to pull them up that's no problem but but it's it's quite fascinating and um you know we lots of my colleagues in the plant-based community don't make i've never heard anyone make this this differential um and um i plant-based or otherwise a lot of people talk about low carb, wheat free. Yes. But I like to get into, and really it's the biochemistry of the food. So there are different aspects of this discussion. You know, one, uh, the effect of wheat and the inflammatory trigger of the hybridized wheat on uh, diabetes and insulin resistance. The fact that it not only affects the insulin receptor, but also the insulin. Just lost you again. But I think you were saying that it not only affects the insulin receptor, but also um, the insulin molecule itself. So yeah, we'll fi different, definitely find a lot of that happening. You'll see more and more of that occurring with the diabetes, with more, more and more people developing diabetes because what we've also discovered is that this this insulin or this 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 new gluten actually damages the cells those beta cells it actually damages the beta cells that actually secrete the insulin and so that really has become more of a problem because of this damage to the beta cells themselves and so when there's damage to the beta cells, then my gestalt is that with, with that damage actually occurs the problem of, of damaging what the beta cells would normally produce. And I think about that because when you think about the idea that when a person with type 2 diabetes has, ends up being or needing to take insulin, they're actually replacing what your body makes with the normal type of insulin. Mm. Like that's something that your receptor can recognize. Mm. So that's what made me feel like there's got to be something going on with the actual insulin that your body's producing. If you're able mm. to replace it with some that's, that's, that's bioidentical to what your body would normally produce. Okay. I see what you're saying. That's an excellent, excellent point. You know, it's interesting because it's, it's, I'm glad you pointed that out because I always thought that the receptor issue was a reduction in receptor density. But you raise an interesting point that the receptor may be partially damaged or not damaged. It may be more damaged with the insulin uh, or maybe a combination. What would you think? Maybe a combination. combination? Yeah, yeah, maybe a combination. Mm hmm that's that's fascinating. That's fascinating. And, and again, as I was saying before we lost connection, I apologize. This is uh, okay. the first time it's happened. I have to talk to my IT people. But we, uh, the, the thing I like about this conversation is that, and I want to, I want our audience to extrapolate. We have to understand the food as its biochemistry, and what we're getting into is the biochemistry of the food. You're talking yes. about the gluten versus the gluten, the, the different components are different. Like components of the wheat. And when we make these biochemical changes, for whatever reason, we're trying to feed the poor, we're trying to make more money, whatever the changes are, our reasons are, uh, it has a definite effect 
on the nature of the food and it also has a definite effect on the food's biochemistry of the body. And so these biochemical changes not only apply to how the food is grown, but how it's prepared or processed or stored prior to consumption. Exactly. And so what I often try to convey to my patients and, and, and wellness clients is that uh, be aware of how you procure your food and understand where the foods come from, how it's grown, and what happens to it from the time it's grown, harvested, and placed on your meal table. Uh, and yes. so this is a great il illustration of that. Definitely, yes. A great mm -hmm. illustration of that. So um, as you look for those wonderful photographs, I want to steer. I have the picture up here, but... Uh -huh. But I'm having a bit of a problem sharing it on, on this screen. Okay. Um, so I'm trying to figure another way to do that. Let's it's see. not letting you under present to... Uh, maybe I, maybe I'll, I'll send it to you. How about that? Okay. No, that'd be perfect. Yeah, send it to me, uh, both of my emails, and I'll find and share it. And while you or do I can, that... Can I text it to you? Uh, yeah, you can text it. That'd be fine. Um, while you do that... I want to share with the audience. There we go. The final commentary, which is type one diabetes. So, what are your thoughts on type one diabetes and its potential uh, reversibility? Well, that's you know that is an interesting thought. What I believe is 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 really interesting is that there are people who have type one diabetes, Cyrus, if you know Cyrus, and I can't remember Cyrus's last name right now, but he is a type one diabetic and he is whole food plant based. And he has noticed that that his requirement of insulin has gone down significantly from when he was eating the standard American diet. Mm. What I think why I think that is very interesting is that there was probably something that actually continues to damage the cells mm -hmm. that doesn't allow it to completely like to reverse the need for it. But there are studies that have actually shown that a whole food plant based diet will actually help with beta cell recovery. Mm -hmm. And those have been done in animal studies. Um, and I, I think that that some more research needs to be done in this area, but that's a really clear uh, or, or at least an interesting thought that with this beta cell recovery, what we do know is that there are not only beta cells in the pancreas itself, but there are alpha cells as well, as well as beta cells. And those alpha cells are responsible for secreting what's called glucagon. And the glucagon is what what kind of balances the sugar. So if you're if, if at nighttime your blood sugar goes down too low, the alpha cells are going to kick in so that it can make it can secrete glucagon so that it can increase the amount of glucose so that it doesn't go too low because we know that we don't want to be hypoglycemic. Well, those alpha cells can actually transform into beta cells mm. to help the beta cells to recover, which is which is really an interesting phenomenon. And so when we look at that, can type one diabetes be reversed? We don't know the answer to that, but I think it's an intriguing thought. And I wonder if some of the toxins that damage the beta cells that in that really long list of toxins that includes things like uh, polyvinyl chlorides and includes a, a too much fat, too much sugar, too much, um, too many toxins, too much glyphosate, too much, you know, too, too many of those toxins. Could those toxins, if we were to eliminate some of those toxins, would we allow those cells to recover? You know, that's a great thought. I mean, I remember we had this discussion. We had a nice discussion after your talks so of a sidebar. And, and uh, I agree with you 100%. I mean, the, the analogy that comes to mind is if you have a patient who's uh, in the ICU and you're infusing a sedative and the patients, they're getting this ongoing sedative and the patient's asleep, they don't wake up. And so, well, can the patient wake up? No, the patient can't wake up. Well, if you stop the sedative, the patient will wake up. And, and if you have the toxins, yeah, if you have the toxin suppression function, then the suppression of function 
Uh, keep, and so if you have the mindset, well, you have type 1 diabetes, take your insulin, eat whatever you want. It's never going to come back. Guess what? You'll be right. Exactly. Exactly. And, but if you have that idea, so wait a minute, let's do a nutritional cleansing and detox and let's remove all the toxin and let's see if the pancreas can heal. Now, I have in my clinic I've had patients come in uh, with the diagnosis of type 1 diabetes. We put them on a nutritional detox and we have to take them off the insulin. Now, my thinking is that, well, this is not type 1 diabetes, it was a misdiagnosis. But was it a misdiagnosis of the, the pancreas to recover, given your theory? And, and I think both are possible, uh, but I like to, I mean, and we also talked about the whole idea, as you, you alluded to earlier, that the, pan, the beta cells may not be dead, they just may be suppressed because of the ongoing toxicity. That's one. Two, if some are dead, then they can be replaced by alpha cells. And so mm -hmm. that potentially two recovery mechanism of somebody has who's technically have type 1 diabetes, but it can be reversible. So I want to throw that out there. And mm -hmm. of course, people come and say, well, you know, Dr. Montgomery, Dr. Powell started saying so you can reverse type 1 diabetes. All oh, those people are crazy. Uh, but um, I don't think it's a crazy idea. And uh, we've had lots of people on insulin pumps. We've taken off insulin pumps. They've been told they were type 1. Now, granted, so if your pancreas is truly dead, the beta cells are dead, there is a, a certain point of no return. And I'm not right. saying those patients don't exist. Right. But I think there are probably too many patients who are labeled as type 1 who are not at that point of no return, who don't give the opportunity to return because they don't give the body the right nutritional cleansing to yes. give it the ability to heal itself. Absolutely. Absolutely. Wow. And what's, I think that that's, that's, you, 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 you said that really nicely. I, I think that we don't know the answer to that and, and more research would need to be done, but we have seen anecdotally that you've, you've shown that, that you've seen people come off of that. So whether that is a misdiagnosis or if that is true recovery, we, we still, you know, we need to do some more studies on that. But I think it's certainly worth investigating and doing studies on to determine if there really is this beta cell recovery. And it looks like a lot of the research that's coming out is starting to indicate that there is that recovery, that there are some that that beta cells can recover when the damage is removed. And one of the things that's very interesting with this whole hybridization of wheat, incidentally, it even says in the Bible not to hybridize. And so we're like, uh, that Bible doesn't really. Send me, send me that verse. <laughs> it's uh, Leviticus 19. I believe it's, let me tell you, it's actually in two different. It's actually in two different, there are two different scriptural references. That's More fine. You can send me off, off, uh, off record. I'll share with the audience later. <laughs> yes, indeed, indeed. And while uh, you bring that up, I'm going to bring these pancakes up. This yes. Is, uh, this is a nice way to end the show, these <laughs> beautiful pancakes. And, and, I, and please either, I think you have both my email addresses. Email me these recipes. Uh, for your bread and pancakes, if you don't mind, lots of people. Well, not at all. The recipes. <laughs> not at all. Not at all. I'm I'm all happy to share. Everyone. Now this is beautiful. So these are pancakes. You have sliced walnuts and and uh, you have sliced bananas. And uh, what do you have drizzled over here? So what I put on there was almond butter. So I mm. drizzled almond butter over them. And so those are almonds. I put a little bit of almond extract in the pancake mix so that, you know, I kind of like to repeat the flavor. So it's kind of an almond banana thing. And so I actually slice bananas and put banana slices between the layers of the mm. of the pancakes and then and then drizzled the almond butter on top and the slithered almonds. I, I toasted the almonds and slithered, and then they were already slithered. I guess I didn't slice them like that. <laughs> <laughs> but they were slithered, but I toasted them just in a dry skillet, just toasted them in the dry skillet, and then sprinkled them over that with the bananas and pure maple syrup on top. Wow, wow. What a masterpiece. So as you can see, uh, natural, healthy, plant-based food doesn't have to be boring. Uh, it can yes. be fun and interesting and tasty. And uh, you can have your pancakes. And, and uh, eat them too. And eat them too. That's right. You have your pan have your cake and eat it too. Now these uh, the texture of these pancakes, from what you recall, other pancakes. What 
What's the difference if you can make that comparison? Well, I would say that that eggs do make your pancakes fluffier, mm -hmm. um, but they were certainly quite delicious. And you can do some other things like maybe put in like, um, and I didn't do this, uh, but you can put an egg replacer, alfalfa. You can use those kinds of things to put in there. But um, but the but the pancakes were were absolutely delicious. And, you know, what's interesting is that when I was growing up, we were you know, I grew up in a family of eight kids and a mom and dad. There were lots of us. We didn't always have eggs. So, oh, wow. you know, sometimes we just had, pan, you know, the pancake mix in water and there were no eggs to to make it fluffy. And we loved the pancakes even well, without I the eggs. I grew up in a family of three. I was the youngest, but I, ate enough, I personally ate enough for six. So I guess we had eight people eating with me. <laughs> my <appetite. laughs> well, Dr. Starr, this has been wonderful. This is, um, again, I always learn when we talk, and we're going to have to get together more. Um, I, I know you do a lot of work with uh, Alzheimer's, and I'd like to get your take on that. I'm sure the audience uh, look forward to... Um, uh, hearing more from you and and i certainly do and and as i i'm going to close out but uh please stay by behind stage i want to um sure. uh, i have some ideas i want to share with you but anyway thank you very much thanks for coming and sharing your wisdom and knowledge uh with our audience and uh, we look forward to having you back uh sometime very soon so um as we we close out thank you very much this has uh, been very enlightening and this will not be the only show we bring dr started on and other guests and so i thank all of you who supported the channel and of course uh any questions or comments leave them in the comment box and of course until next time uh, i want you to take care and we'll see you at the next video